I'm glad you're joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman, coming to you from Atlanta in September of 2021. And today we're going to be talking with wildlife biologist and author Doug Chadwick about insights from his latest book, Four Fifths a Grizzly, a new perspective on nature that just might save us all. Published by Patagonia, Four Fifths a Grizzly is a stylish and beautiful book that features close to 100 full color photos of nature, along with Doug's engaging series of personal essays that argue for the amazing interconnectedness of nature, advocating that the path toward conservation begins with how we see our place in the world. Gathered from decades of observing and reporting, Four Fifths a Grizzly challenges anyone to consider whether we are separate from or part of nature. More info can be found on the publisher website, patagonia.com. Our guest tonight is the author, Doug Chadwick, who has a master's degree in wildlife biology and studied mountain goats among the peaks of the Rockies for seven years. He also carried out surveys of grizzly bears and of harlequin ducks that breed along the Rockies' fast-moving rivers and streams. In his other role as a journalist, Doug has reported on wildlife around the world, from right whales in the sub-Antarctic to snow leopards in the Himalaya, producing close to 50 articles for National Geographic magazine. In addition to his hundreds of magazine articles, he's written 13 books about wildlife and conservation, including several focused on the Rocky Mountains and the region's animals like wolverines and grizzlies. He's a resident of Montana, and over the past nine years, much of his free time has been spent as a volunteer helping carry out groundbreaking groundbreaking wolverine research in Glacier National Park in Montana. Welcome, Doug. Oh, thank you. Um, we, we can stop right there. That was such a great introduction. We'll just call that a show. Everyone's just impressed, I'm sure. <laughs> well, and most of us have never even seen a wolverine. And so I wanted to just briefly ask you, I'm curious about your wolverine research in Glacier Park, because your book mentions how wolverines are mischaracterized in the media and in folklore as being ferocious attackers of humans but based on your experiences what are what are wolverines really like uh, <laughs> well they are fierce they've got yeah. attitude plus <laughs> um but look they weigh 30 35 pounds and are three feet long without their extra foot of tail um so it's pretty overblown reputation we and we give carnivores the same treatment usually we decide they're nasty surly unsociable and a danger to us before we know anything about them and the reason i got involved for that long with this study was hey wolverines high grade the country they're along the peaks of the continental divide in the back country in the most remote wild and beautiful kind of landscapes um and we didn't know a darn thing about them. We're just managing right. managing them in ignorance. And so as a result was there are probably fewer than 350, maybe fewer than 300 south of Canada. What? Whereas, oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, so it's critical to know more about them because they used to be in California, Colorado, you wow. know, up and down the coastal and the Rocky Mountain Ranges. And we just sort of were happily um, trapping and and uh, shooting them out of existence and uh, say, well, on the assumption that they're a certain kind of predator. And, and as we got to know them, of course, we find family relationships. We find an incredible mountaineering species that climbs the tallest peaks faster yeah. than any other critter here in the middle of winter when it's all ice and snow. And I can't tell you why. Wow. Um, they cover ground like you wouldn't believe. Even a snow leopard would be hard to keep up, uh, have a difficult time keeping up with a wolverine. And um, they have territories. Again, this 35 pound animal has a territory the size of a big male grizzly bear, hundreds of wow. square miles. <laughs> so it was fascinating. And yeah. The great thing about look, studying nature in general is the more you look, the more you find, and there's no end to the wonder. But with wolverines, it was like on any given day, at any given moment, uh, if you're really out there trying to keep up and keeping your eyes open, um, you might learn something altogether new. And we yeah. did. And That's that was exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was exciting. And um, it's one of many wonderful um, 
<laughs> completely unpaid things that I do. Um, uh, uh, I, I, one of these days, I may get serious about trying to make a living, but I doubt it. <laughs> <One of these laughs> days. Well, related to your book, Four Fifths of Grizzly, when scientists are trying to have us make genealogical connections with other animals, they usually focus on great apes like chimpanzees or gorillas as, as you know, we're primates and we share the highest percentage of DNA with fellow great apes. Now, while I know your book also features primates, what was your inspiration for taking a different approach in the title and in the cover and focusing on the genealogical connection between humans and grizzly bears? Like why bears in particular? Okay. Um, well, because people have heard about primates. Um, yeah. And it's a pretty spectacular figure. You know, it's 98% plus similar to chimpanzees and 97 or 96 with orangutans and gorillas. But you know, grizzly bears are something we think of as very unlike us. Right. And a danger to boot. And then there's, you know, generations of rip snorting stories about what's a grizzly bear really like and um, fierce and destructive and a holy terror. And, and I thought, well, first of all, when you mention the word grizzly, that gets people's attention. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it, it focuses the mind wonderfully. And if I said, um, I am 80% or 80% plus of my genes are identical to all mammals look. Um, but if I said, uh, I am four fifths of duck billed platypus, um, <laughs> I don't think it would get the same. They might say, what's response. wrong with you, Doug? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> uh, get, it'd be Chad, yeah. get, get help. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> Um, the, the other reason is that grizzlies are, because they are, you know, big and can potentially uh, shred you, yeah. um, and because I live in country where they abound, I raised two children in a cabin in the densest grizzly bear population in the lower 48 here in northwestern Montana, they're much on my mind. They're much right. on the mind of every tourist I, I cross trails with in Glacier Park and the surroundings. And I decided I talk about them all the time. We all have opinions about them yeah. all the time, but I don't know that much about them. So like with wolverines, I wanted to study them. And I made a point of spending a lot of time, not only here in the Rockies, but on salmon streams on the coast of British Columbia and in Alaska. And I just found I could walk freely among you know, multi, well, bears up to 1,200 pounds fishing for salmon, and they're totally tolerant of me. Wow. And, um, well, they're well fed. They've got a yeah. <laughs> massive bounty of protein. And, they, and they're not they, scared of you. They're not scared of me. And the best part was, as I got used to that, they're, I'm not scared of them. And so the whole... Yeah. That whole, all the walls built of fear and misunderstanding can sort of evaporate. And I'm just there watching bears. And then I realized each bear is as different from every other bear in terms of temperament and personality. Yeah. They, don't, they live yeah. 35 five years. They're learning the whole time. They got one of the biggest brains relative to body size of any carnivore. And they are what they are born to be, but they're also what they've learned. And, mm. and over a long lifetime. And so they're all individuals. So I was yes. watching per bear personalities and I was watching how, you know, I'm sometimes uh, 10 feet away and you can see all the subtleties of their behavior and how they fine tune that and how they get along with each other and, oh. or don't get along uh, if they're squabbling yeah. <laughs> over a good fishing hole. But anyway, just, they, besides being highly intelligent and very, very curious, um, they manipulate objects. They're, you yeah. know, despite those big, clum what to us look like big clumsy looking paws with long claws, but they they investigate objects and, and diddle, doodle with them. Um, and to find out, uh, I don't know what it is, but they're curious about what they are. And I, they're easy to relate to, I guess is what it comes yeah. down to. Plus they walk on two legs like us at times. Yeah. And so I could, because I'm so keyed up um, 
all my nerves and glands and everything I'm built from as a as a Homo sapiens over the last you know hundreds of thousands of years is is working full tilt. I'm I'm cooking on high, and I'm so keyed up that I'm I'm alive in a way I I'm I'm not around other animals and my senses. I feel like I'm seeing more of what another animal does. And so I can start to yeah. see myself and the bear, the bear and me. And, you know, I can often predict what they're going to do next. And, hmm. and now I said, I can often predict. Um, sometimes I'm even occasionally right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, sometimes predict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once yeah. in a while. But anyway, it, they break down the barrier for me between us and other species. And I just thought I would, pick the bear because I do happen to know a fair amount about bears and I've yeah. lived with them for decades. Yeah. And because it would right away set the tone for the book, like nature is not what you assume it to be. Right. And I want I like, I noticed in my work, I also like to promote us developing an environmental or animal identity where we recognize our kinship with nature as like a foundational pathway to social change is like my last book um, has ourselves recognizing ourselves as human animal earthlings. But what do you think are some obstacles we have to overcome for more people to embrace a less anthropocentric or more biocentric way of viewing ourselves. And I, I, one of the reasons I asked that question is because some people, um, you know, like don't believe in evolution or don't like to be yeah. compared to other animals. So they put up like a mental block or they might say, well, I know I'm technically an animal and not a plant. And that's like a scientific category, but culturally I'm going to reject the label of animal because that's characterized as degrading. And so yeah, for those yeah. of us who are trying to kind of make the connections like, Hey, let's celebrate. We're animals. I don't know. Have you found any ways to talk about it when some people don't, don't find that comparison useful or well, motivating? One thing I want to say before I forget, Carrie, okay, is, is, um, when I talk about seeing the myself and the bear, the bear yeah. and me to some extent, and I don't mean it in a woo-woo um, sense, um, the, or the, you know, they're my big cuddly animal brothers. Uh, right. But they're studying me is what I realize when I'm up close and personal mm -hmm. and they're making judgments. Yes. And I get the same feeling when I'm with elephants. I get the same feeling when I'm with orcas. And they'll come over and study you. And I've been mm. nose to nose with <laughs> other right whales and humpback whales. And they, I, I felt like a little bug on a leaf um, with a human looking at it going, oh my gosh, this great big thing is paying attention oh, to me and study. Yeah. But I'm being studied and while I'm studying this animal. But the, the, to answer your question, I am 80 plus percent identical um, to these other species and, and the mammals. Um, but I'm also, you know, 60 some percent related to birds and 50 some mm. to 60 with fish. And mm. I could go on down the scale on yeah. 30 30% 30 with vegetation. Huh. I'm 24% a wine grape. I'm 41% <laughs> a, a fruit fly. And on down to I'm 7% bacteria and 8% of my human genome with the DNA in me is a viral origin, which hmm. means our ancestors got an infection way back when and incorporated a viral sequ sequence hmm. into its DNA. So that's who we are. That's what builds us. And that's what we share with every other species out there. So instead of trying to argue people into being, well, you are an animal because of all the connotations that come with that word, I just say you are your genes, <laughs> you are made of this percent of the same stuff. And, and you have some percent of the same stuff with every creature we know on this living planet. And instead of the cultural assumption that this being an animal, being a creature, um, somehow, uh, what it, it, it takes away from our our favorite view of ourselves, which is as separate and superior to the yes. rest of creation. I'd say, no, look, look, it makes us so much more than human. Mm. I mean, we're, we're yeah. a wonderful, we're a wonderful species. And I, I try hard to avoid the 
kind of some of the environmental rhetoric about, you know, castigating people for being greedy and selfish and um, <laughs> self-absorbed, yeah. you know, because we're a wonderful, cr imaginative, creative species. And none of these facts coming out in the scientific world, especially in the last few decades, that haven't got out very far to the public, but none of them really demean us or dilute our our humanness is just that we're that and so much more and and that's why in addition to the genetic links we have with the rest of life um i bring out the fact that we have look i started off as a microbe right i, I started off four one thousandths of an inch in size as a fertilized egg hmm. and there were you know amoeba bigger than i was um but i had plans and i turned into a human <laughs> with 30 trillion human cells but i've got more microbial cells than that in my body huh. and that's you know yeast and bacteria and archaea and protozoans and they inhabit my gut which determines a lot of my health and contributes hormones to my system probably controls some of my moods and therefore maybe my thoughts now a lot of people are starting to talk about the microbiome um, but it's in my gut, it's in my mouth, it's on every millimeter of skin. Mm -hmm. And I'm a compound creature. Um, yeah. if, you, if you ground me up and analyzed all the DNA in me, about 1% or so would be human and 99% would be microbial. And they're all doing things within us. Some, some are just neutral hangers on. We're, we're, we're a body the size of a planet would be to a human. Um, they're just there. It's a living place for them. But others are doing all kinds of things. They're digesting food for us. They're making vitamins and fatty acids. They're defending us against disease. Um, this is us. This is who we are. And, yeah. and then inside every one of our cells are the little organelles called mitochondria. And they are the energy sources. I mean, I can talk to you, I can look at this computer screen, I can look out my window, think, feel, uh, do everything I do, they power it. Mm -hmm. And they are modified bacteria that long ago formed an association with a larger cell and are now every living plant and animal and a lot of single celled animals have mitochondria in them. We mm -hmm. all have that in common. So again, I'm, where's the individual here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and your book really brings us to life too, with the beautiful photographs in it, that makes you more interested even in single cell organisms than you, I ever thought I would be. <laughs> so yeah, like, I, I really love your answer to my question. And I am actually going to think about it a lot, like, in, in terms of the way I frame my advocacy in terms of saying humans are even more because i think sometimes i try to get us to be much more humble but it's potentially i could take a different tack and kind of say like oh isn't this spectacular not only we're we human we're also four fifths of grizzly yeah <laughs> you know? yeah yeah like i i really like uh, i'm gonna take some of this enthusiasm you have and try to incorporate it well, well I, yeah. I love it yeah i i, I just want to say the the Grizzly bears are very humbling. <laughs> it's good to get. Yeah, I, I, uh, sure, I, it, it, it is helpful to have something, or, or like I say, being nose to nose with a whale that that um, you know pretty much puts the ego aside for a while. Yeah, um, I like how you said suddenly you were identifying with being an insect. Like that, yeah, it's I, your scale got so much smaller instead of towering over others. Suddenly, someone was towering over you, and it gives well, you a different perspective. Yeah, and being a biologist, you know, you you also know at some level that that orca that just came by to your your boat, your little skiff or your kayak, and rolled on his side and studied you with that big <laughs> eye. Um, a male orca has a brain four times the size of ours. Wow. Right. A male sperm whale has one six times the size of ours. An elephant three times the size of ours. I mean, we. We may be the the brightest critter out there, but I'm not, you know, I'm not totally convinced, but at least there are some big brains out there that are are watching and learning from us too. And that's that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, I really like how you're pointing out that it's a two-way 
relationship. That's another way to talk about interdependence is that you're watching them and they're watching us. And so I really like that almost like dialogic aspect to (laughs) our relationship with them. Since a lot of times we approach things as just we're studying them, like that they're just a subject for us, but we're a subject for them. Well, Well, if you're, oh, I was just going to give a little um, uh, mid mid talk um, disclaimer here to say, if you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature, and I'm host Carrie Freeman, talking with wildlife biologist and journalist Doug Chadwick about his latest conservation book. It's really gorgeous. It's called Four Fifths of Grizzly, A New Perspective on Nature That Just Might Save Us All. The social media handle for the book publisher is at Patagonia Books. I wanted to um, also just give you a chance to share some of the compelling statistics in your book about how we humans and our billions of domesticated animals have ballooned in numbers and now radically displace and outnumber animals in nature, like to abnormal proportions. Because I don't think we recognize it in our day-to-day lives, but when you hear something like that, we re- it really hits home that how much we've transformed the biosphere and of the planet. Yeah, we, well, uh, one way to put it would be, you know, homo something or other has been around for, you know, millions of years. And homo sapiens has been around for 300 to 350,000. It wasn't until 12,000 years ago that the human population on the globe hit 1 million. It's oh, first, wow. his first one million. Okay. And when I was in school, well, when I was born, there we had about 2 billion people and two point something. And when I was in grad school studying how to go about conservation, we had uh, fewer than half as many people on the planet. We now have almost 8 billion. Wow. So that's from 1 million to 8 billion in a uh, I blink a geologic time. Yeah. So if we're confused about how to deal with, uh, you know, our status today, and we don't really appreciate it, it's because we have nothing to go by, you know, right. way, way beyond comparisons with any, anything that's gone before, unless you're looking at how uh, the rate at which bacteria divide or something, but um, yeah. our, in the last 50 years, uh, and these, these have been some worldwide surveys of thousands of animal populations. Um, the animals we see, mostly mammals and birds, that sort of thing, where there were 10 in the 1970s, there are now three. Mm. So we know we've got an unprecedented level of extinction now, you know, right. unprecedented in human history. Um, but it isn't just extinction, it's the, just the decline in number sheer numbers of the animals we share the planet with the big animals that we we relate to most easily and we treasure the most and it's been a loss of about 70 percent and of the living mass of mammals our closest kin worldwide on land um yeah you mentioned 96 percent of the living weight of the mammals on the planet consists of humans and livestock. That leaves 4% mm. for all the wild mammals that exist. And 4%. 4%. That and is ridiculous. Yeah. And we're still talking about, well, we have to compromise, you know, um, right. uh, we have to find room for human activities in a healthy economy, blah, blah, blah. And the animals, uh, we should do some nature preservation too. But Holy smokes, the compromise that we're, we're kind of come and gone. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, so we, we're we not thinking about it as as we might be. That's that's all I could say. Right. And, and well, we've reached the end of the show and I only have one question left and, and you only have 60 seconds, but it I wanted you <laughs> to share like a recommendation for listeners who are interested in saving a whole lot of species and individuals in nature and doing so in a hurry. Are, do you have um, one or two uh, top suggestions for us? I do, because uh, uh, I know we've got to be quick. Um, I would look into island conservation. Do you say uh, island? Island. 
Um, conservation, 41% of the most critically endangered species on the planet live on islands and there's islands. a group dealing with that. Okay. Um, and as fast as quick and saving a whole lot in a hurry. Um, large landscapes being connected so animal populations can continue to uh, share genes and adapt to changing conditions. Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, y2y.net. Yeah. Um, please look at that. And then Vital Ground, which is a conservation land trust that tries to work with private landowners, willing landowners to keep space open for wildlife to at least move through, if not use part of the year. Um, Vitalground.org. Um, we've saved tens of hundreds of thousands of acres at this point and made connections between our remaining wildlife. So that plus open space, zoning laws, land planning, again, we 8 billion people are using up and monopolizing so much of the space of the earth. Yeah. Good word. Yeah. Cl climate change is the big deal, but it's just the sheer presence and activity and monopolization of resources by 8 billion humans that is the biggest threat to wildlife. Yeah, and so. all the um, quote unquote livestock if, for, if people are continuing to eat, choose to eat animals. Well, I mm -hmm. am, I was inspired by your book to also, I'm going to have a guest on a future show from Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative because I really Wonderful. want it. So you, you really focused on it as a, a role model for wildlife yeah. corridors. Um, and so I, I'm going to follow up in a future show to talk more about that because I think it's fantastic. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the end of our show, but I want to thank you, Doug Chadwick, for being with us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. And thanks for your decades of service to wilderness conservation as a scientist, as a wilderness volunteer, and as a prolific nature writer and journalist. Well, gosh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for giving me a chance to, to rant and rave here. This has been wonderful. It um, has been great. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com backslash In Tune to Nature. The views and opinions expressed on the show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman, asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species. Thank you for listening. Cheers.